across Canada. Thank you for joining us today. Stories of mythological creatures have been part of human history for centuries. These creatures dwelt in many places, from deep, dark forests to the vast, bitter, cold Arctic to the uninhabitable deep sea. They've taken many forms, from flying horses to dragons to mermaids. They're symbols of human imagination, curiosity, and fear. The stories of old tell a tale of a creature that rises from the deep, a creature with many arms that's known to take ships, their cargo, and their crew to the bottom of the sea for eternity, to dwell in Davy Jones's locker. This mythical creature has been known as the Kraken. A scientific expedition not too many years ago set out to find this kraken in its natural environment. Today, the crew of that expedition live to tell the tale. Our guest speaker today, a lead scientist from that trip, with 40 years of experience in studying the ocean and its creatures, the first scientist credited with seeing, observing, and recording the Kraken in its natural habitat. She's here to talk with us about this mythical creature of old, the giant squid, Dr. Edith Witter. Thank you, Jonathan. So you guys have all thought this through, right? You've come to hear a talk on the giant squid in the 4D theater. So you're, you're prepared for the fact that a tentacle may whip out from under your chair with um, serrated suckers and wrap around your ankle at some point during this talk. Just, you know, you want to think about these things. So as Jonathan said, the Kraken has been a beast of legend for a very, very long time. In fact, we have written record of a description of the giant squid going back to the first century BC with Pliny the Elder. For those of you that aren't up on your Greeks, your ancient Greeks, Pliny the Elder was a, a well-known naturalist. And he described this creature that had 30-foot-long arms, weighed 700 pounds, and had a head as big as a cask. Um, if you don't know Pliny the Elder um, in this context, you might also know him as the guy that actually discovered hops, um, for which he's um, equal, equally famous um, and has been immortalized in what is considered one of the great beers, I'm told. <laughs> um, yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, it remained a creature of legend uh, uh, up until 1861 when a French ship off the Canary Islands um, saw it, a giant squid floating at the surface. And there was uh, stories, shall we say, that, that it was a vicious creature that they had to uh, subdue with gunfire and cannon shot. Um, and then they wrapped a rope around it. And as they tried to pull it aboard, the head and the arms fell off. And so they were left with just the mantle, um, which they brought back to the French Academy, uh, where quite a few of the scientists said that this was impossible, even though it was sitting right in front of them, um, that nature could not produce such a beast. But in fact, it ended up being published um, as the first account of a giant squid. And actually, in the audience that day was a gentleman named Jules Verne. Um, and so that's how the giant squid ended up being included in his book, which was published in 1870, The 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And that contributed to the tales of this kraken, this, this beast of legend that was supposedly so terrifying. Now, <clears throat> um, there were many stories over, the, over time. Um, but one in 1873 came back with evidence. Um, this was a, a, a place called Chain Tickle off of New, uh, Newfoundland. 
This story has taken many forms, including a children's story, um, where in this case it was a young boy that saved the day when a giant squid attacked their fishing boat um, by chopping off its uh, tentacles. Um, and, but they brought back one of these tentacles. It was 19 feet long. And they brought it to a well-known scientist at Yale University, a Addison Emery Verrill. Um, and in 1873, they did this drawing from life, um, which may be considered kind of the first um, true imagery of anything to do with the giant squid. And then actually, one month later, in the same area off of Newfoundland, a giant squid washed ashore. And so this is the first actual photograph of a giant squid ever taken. And it truly was a terrifying beast. After all of these years of hearing these legends of things that were just really hard to imagine, it's a head-footed monster with the arms and uh, these lash, eight lashing arms and um, two whipping tentacles are growing right out of this head. It's got a jet propulsion system. Um, it's got three hearts that pump blue blood. It's uh, got an eye that's bigger than anything in the natural world. I mean, it's, it's enormous. Um, so it truly was a, an, a terrifying creature to, to many people. Over the years, there have been many uh, carcasses recovered um, and pictures taken of them. Um, this one was actually taken off the, of New Zealand. Um, and there have been many um, sightings of dead giant squid. Uh, there's hot spots off of Newfoundland, New Zealand, Japan. And there have been a series of giant squid expeditions to go and hunt of the giant squid. One of these, uh, actually it, it ended up being in two parts, was a multinational expedition, cost a tremendous amount of money. Um, it was off of New Zealand, and it took place in 1997 and 1999. Some of you may have seen it on the Discovery Channel, uh, but the result was they got nothing. They saw nothing. Now, uh, then in 2004, Dr. Sunumi Kubadera, who has been a giant squid enthusiast his entire life, um, has studied the giant squid, and believed that he could get images of the giant squid. So working off the Ogasawara Islands in Japan, he would go out with the Japanese fishermen. He did this for two years, putting down a long line, 900 meters long, with a camera on it and bait. And two years, he kept going out uh, and finally got these photographs. And they just electrified the world. And Dr. Kubadera, known as Ku to his friends, um, is a very gentle, unassuming man. He was just completely overwhelmed by the attention that this brought down upon him. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think he just couldn't even believe it, that, that people went so crazy, that these images you know, finally existed, that this thing was seen in its natural habitat with these still photographs. And so this is what prompted the NHK, which is the Japan Broadcasting Corporation and Discovery Channel, um, to partner to put together yet another expedition um, to go in search of the giant squid. To, to, to this elusive thing, the uh, getting film of the giant squid in its natural habitat has been referred to as the holy grail of natural history cinematography. So, now, how did I come into this? Because I'm not a giant squid hunter. Um, I am a deep sea biologist. And actually, my involvement kind of goes back almost more than two decades ago, uh, is how I got started. I actually was working on a PhD in neurobiology and was studying bioluminescence, animals in the ocean that make light. And I got this amazing opportunity to make a series of dives in this deep diving suit that was developed for the offshore oil industry for diving on oil rigs down to 2,000 feet in the ocean. And I was one of several scientists, this was right after I completed my PhD, um, that was, uh, uh, te were testing this suit as a tool for ocean exploration. Now, because I was studying bioluminescence, I really wanted to see what the bioluminescence in the ocean looked like. People have known it was there for years, 
um, putting light detectors down in the ocean. People had been able to measure it, but nobody had really seen what deep sea bioluminescence looked like. <clears throat> and so my first dive in the WASP, I went down to a depth of 880 feet. It was an evening dive in the Santa Barbara Channel, and I turned out the lights. And I turned out the lights because I knew I would see bioluminescence, but I was just utterly, completely unprepared for how much there was and how spectacular it was. I saw siphonophore chains that were twice as long as this room, pumping out so much light that I could read all the dials and gauges inside the suit without a flashlight. And flashes of uh, bright lights and, and glows, the, these um, plumes of what looked like smoke. Uh, but you turn on the light, it didn't seem to be much there, but every, all around you was just this amazing light show. Blue sparks that would swirl up off the thrusters, just like when you throw a log on a campfire, and the embers swirl up off the campfire, only these were shiny blue embers. Just absolutely breathtaking. Now, usually if people know anything about bioluminescence at all, it's these guys, fireflies, and there are a few other land animals that can make lights, some millipedes and centipedes, earthworms, fungi even. Uh, but in general, on land, bioluminescence is quite rare. And so people are left with the impression that it's a generally rare phenomenon. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, in the open ocean environment, <coughs> um, if you drag a net from 200 meters to the surface, most of the animals that you bring up in that net make light. Most of the fish, squid, shrimp, jellyfish make light. And in many places, 80 to 90% of those animals make light. This light is called bioluminescence. Now, <clears throat> you really have to see it to believe it. So I've got some video here of what it looks like from a submersible. This is in the Johnson Ceiling submersible, and that's a screen that I would mount in front of the sub. Inside the sub with me is an intensified video camera. It's uh, when you turn out the lights, you see sparkle, but that's not luminescence. That's just electronic noise on these super intensified cameras. You don't see the luminescence until we start to move the submersible forward. But when we do, animals bumping into the screen are stimulated to bioluminesce. And as you move forward, you just see this spectacular living light show that goes on and on and on. And this, this actually was filmed in the Gulf of Maine at around um, 230 meters. Um, and it, you know, what we're seeing are jellyfish and crustacea um, primarily hitting the screen, um, but different displays for, for different types of animals. And just amazing amounts of light that they put out. So I'd be sitting inside the submersible with this light just streaming around me, and I could see the pilot sitting next to me um, by the, the light of the bioluminescence. And sometimes you can easily identify what's making the light. That was a jellyfish that hit the screen. So to appreciate bioluminescence, you really need to see it with your own eyes. So I brought along some bioluminescence to share with you today, uh, and we're going to try that here in the 4D theater. It seems appropriate by turning the lights out. Hopefully they can do that well enough. And I've got a, a little bottle here that has some bioluminescent plankton in it. And you'll note that there's no light coming from it right now because you need to actually stimulate it somehow just as the things were hitting the screen. But hopefully when I stir this up, you'll be able to see what bioluminescence really looks like. So that's living light. It's a spectacular light show. Now, you'll note if I shake it again, it's not quite as bright the next time, and it won't be as bright the next time because it is living light. Now, let's, <coughs> let's not turn the lights back on just yet. <coughs> so living light is done by um, a chemical reaction. Bioluminescence is known as a form of chemiluminescence, which just means you've got chemicals that are mixed together um, to make the light. And you're familiar with this in the form of light sticks. Um, so if I break one of these light sticks and shake it up, I make light. And I'm going to pass these around so that you can feel for yourself that there's no heat coming from these. 
And depending on which chemicals you mix together, you can make different colors of light. And in fact, the um, bioluminescence in the ocean comes in all different colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, although this blue is the color that's predominant down there because that's the color that travels furthest through seawater. And so animals have evolved a color that is most effective for them in terms of um, being able to see that light. So we can have the lights back up now. Thank you. <clears throat> and we can pass these around. You can pass them that way. Those guys have already felt these before. <laughs> So that bioluminescent plankton that I shook up for you was due to this guy. This is a dinoflagellate um, called Pyrocystis fusiformis. It's actually the one that I did my PhD thesis on. Um, and the light that you saw came from little uh, organelles inside the cell that mix chemicals together like the ones we just mixed up in um, those light sticks, although it's not um, the same chemicals. Um, there are chemicals those chemicals are man-made chemicals. Um, the animals make their own chemicals, and different creatures make different chemicals. <clears throat> now, this fish, for example, uses bioluminescence in a light organ behind the eye that helps it see in the dark. This is called a rat trap fish because it has this bizarre jaw structure. You're actually seeing the back of the jaw there. Those are the teeth in the back of the jaw. This is a, a ligament, like an elastic band that holds the bottom of the, the mouth in place. And this weird jaw structure allows it to unhinge <coughs> and open its mouth um, to swallow things larger than itself. This fish um, has high beams for being able to see in the dark. And this, my favorite fish, actually has three different light organs um, under each eye, different colors. That one's blue, this one's uh, this is red and orange. We don't know why different colors of red, um, but we think the blue is used as high beams for seeing over long distances, and the red is apparently used uh, for a, a sniper scope because this fish, unlike most animals in the deep ocean, can actually see red light. Most animals in the ocean only see blue light, but this fish can produce red light and see red light so it puts out this beam of light that only it can see to be able to sneak up on animals and be able to see without being seen. And actually, this is a trick that I borrowed from this fish for the deep sea squid expedition, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Another way they use bioluminescence is as a lure. This is a chin barbel that it can dangle in front of its mouth to attract prey. Other animals use this trick, for example, Nemo or actually the anglerfish in Nemo. Um, now, that lure attracts in these unsuspecting prey. Uh, I do wish that Pixar, given their budget, could have done just a little bit more research um, to determine that those are the eyes of a fish that's been preserved in formalin. <laughs> these are the eyes of a living anglerfish. Um, and she's got this lure called an esca that she sticks out in front of her mouth that is used to um, attract food. Um, this lovely lady uh, has this lure with all these different little threads dangling off it. And we used to think that the different shapes of lures were meant to attract different types of prey, but scientists doing stomach content analyses on these fish discovered that they all actually eat pretty much the same things. Now we believe that the different shape of the lure is how a male identifies a female of his own um, species. And so in the anglerfish world, uh, many of the males are what are known as dwarf males. Um, so this little guy uh, actually has no visible means of self-support. He has no lure for attracting food and no teeth for eating it if he were able to capture it. What he has got is big eyes because what he's got to do is he's got to find himself a babe. His only hope for existence is as a gigolo. <laughs> he's got to find a babe, and then he's got to latch on for life. So this little guy has found himself this babe. And you will note that he's had the good sense to attach himself in a way that he doesn't actually have to look at her. <laughs> but he does know a good thing when he sees it because his 
in some of these species, his flesh actually fuses with her flesh, her bloodstream grows into his body, and he becomes nothing more than a little sperm sac. I have known people to draw analogies from that. I will not do so. <laughs> Another way that they use bioluminescence in the deep sea is uh, as a distraction for predators. Um, there's a lot of animals that can actually release their bioluminescent chemicals. This shrimp is spewing out luminescence from its mouth like a fire-breathing dragon um, into the face of this viper fish, uh, temporarily blinding it so that it can pulse away into the darkness. There's even a uh, fish that had used this trick. This fish is called the shining tube shoulder because it actually literally has a tube on its shoulder. And I was lucky enough to capture one of these fish. I, was, I worked as a, on a consultant on um, the Blue Planet series on the deep portion of Blue Planet. And we were trawling off the northwest coast of Africa with a very special net that had a closing cod end on it that um, sealed the animals at depth and kept them cold, up, uh, bringing them up to the surface. And so we brought this fish up, and I brought it into the lab on the ship. And what you're going to see here is I'm about to touch that tube on its shoulder. And when I do, it squirts out this just astonishing amount of light. But what to me as a scientist is even more astonishing is it's not just the chemicals of light, but it's actually whole cells in this case, which is very unusual. And whole cells means it's nuclei and, and a, a mitochondria. It's expensive. Um, energetically very expensive for this fish to produce light in this way and we have no idea why um, so hopefully somebody here will figure that out someday. Um, this dragonfish has lots of light organs. It's got a light organ under the eye um, and actually it's a different shape in males and females so we think, think that, that uh, this is uh, used for finding a mate and attracting a mate. It's got a chin barbel for attracting food. It's got a whole array of light organs on its belly that it uses for a type of uh, camouflage called counter-illumination um, to mask its silhouette against dim down, downwelling sunlight. Uh, but if you capture one of these animals they will use every light organ they've got in something called a bioluminescent burglar alarm. And the theory behind a bioluminescent burglar alarm is the same as the burglar alarm on your car. The beeping horn and flashing lights are meant to attract attention, which will hopefully scare the burglar away because he wants to be stealthy. He doesn't want to be seen and caught by the police. Well, in the, in the deep ocean, an animal that's being munched on by a predator lights up in the hopes that a hungry predator will see whoever's eating them and want to eat that animal and thereby afford them an opportunity for escape. Um, so in this case, this fish will use all of these light organs if, the, uh, uh, if threatened. Now, you normally don't get to see this because normally we bring these animals up in nets and they've exhausted their luminescence and we don't get to see it. But in this particular case, I managed to capture one of these fish um, from a submersible. Uh, so this is chasing the, this fish um, in the Johnson Sealing submersible off of North Carolina. Turned out the top speed of this fish was one knot, which was the top, top speed of the Johnson Sealing submersible. So we had to chase it for quite a long time, but boy was it worth it because we captured it in one of its capture devices and brought it into the lab and everything on this fish lights up. It's just so breathtakingly beautiful. So you're seeing the light organs out of the eyes flashing. You can actually see the chin barbel flashing there. All of these light organs on the belly, the fins are even lighting up. Everything's lighting up. And, and the reason is, is I'm holding it by, by its tail. It's caught by a predator. So it, that is a scream for help saying, get this scientist away from me. There's other animals that can do this. This is a deep sea jellyfish, quite a common one in, in the deep ocean called a tola. Um, and it produces an equally spectacular display. It's a beautiful, beautiful jellyfish. This is chasing it with the submersible. Um, and that's not any kind of luminescence. That's reflected light that you're seeing from the gonads right there. Um, but, but we captured it in this very special capture device um, that basically brings the animal up untouched, bring it into the lab, and then to get the bioluminescent display you're about to see, all I did was touch it once per second on its nerve ring with a, a dent, dental pick, which is like the sharp tooth of a fish, 
And now that it's going, I'm not touching it anymore. And it's producing this pinwheel of light, this burglar alarm display that I've calculated a predator could see from as much as 100 meters away in the deep ocean. And so I thought, you know, that actually might make kind of a good optical lure. I've made hundreds of dives in submersibles during the course of my career. And every time I'm sitting down in a submersible, I'm always wondering how many animals are there out there just beyond the range of my lights that can see me but I can't see them. And there's a couple of problems here. One is that if we go down in a submersible or worse with a remote operated vehicle, we think we're being stealthy but we're not. It's like driving through the forest in a Sherman tank and wondering why you don't see any wildlife. You're, you're, you're loud, you're noisy, you're producing lights. And so I wanted a, a stealthy way to be able to study these animals. And so I developed a camera system that used red light, just like that fish I showed you earlier. And it, so it could see without being seen. And I did some early tests with it where I put bait down in front of it. But the thing is, bait, dead bait, only um, attracts scavengers. And I wanted to attract active predators. So I thought, you know, this type of bioluminescence might actually be very attractive. So I developed this optical lure that is just 16 blue lights um, embedded in epoxy. And you can see what a shoestring operation it was, because you can see the word Ziploc still in the, um, the mold that we used. Um, but uh, we, it, we just create this pinwheel of light. And the very first time I got to test this was on an expedition to the Gulf of Mexico. It was the first test for the camera system on an expedition. And so it was a, we didn't have much money. Um, it was kind of a crummy camera system. So this next sequence isn't going to look very exciting to you, but to me it was very exciting. Um, so this is a fish um, swimming towards the camera. And the cool thing was that this was being viewed under red light, and I could tell from the way the animals were behaving that they did not seem to be perturbed by the presence of my camera system, which was very exciting. I had my window into the deep sea, something I'd always wanted to be able to just peek into the deep sea and see how things behaved when we weren't down there scaring them away. Four hours into that deployment of that camera system for the very first time, we had programmed the electronic jellyfish to come on. 86 seconds after we turned it on for the very first time, we recorded this. That is a squid over six feet long that is so new to science it could not even be placed in any known scientific family. I could not have asked for a better proof of concept about the fact that maybe, just maybe, we've been exploring the deep sea in a wrong way. We've been scaring the animals away. I mean, if, if after just 86 seconds, you see something nobody's ever seen before, there's a chance that there's a lot down there that we haven't seen before. We have further tests of this. Um, this was another deployment system in the Monterey Canyon. And it became pretty obvious that this was actually a pretty good lure for bringing in squid. That, and in that case, that was a Humboldt squid. And we saw this 26 separate times. Um, and you can see he was a little pissed. He, in <laughs> he, he inked the, uh, because there's supposed to be something there worth eating. That's what brought him in. And, and actually, there were a few responses like this next one. This is clearly the Einstein of squid, because this guy comes in and immediately recognizes that this ain't right. There's supposed to be something to eat here, and what the hell? <laughs> and he's persistent. And he keeps thinking, look, I know there's food here. There's got to be something to eat. But as I said, this is one really smart squid because he thinks about it in his little squid brain for a while and then he comes around and he thinks, well, maybe if I come in from a different angle? <laughs> no, no luck. So it was this success that led me to be invited on this new giant squid expedition. And I convinced them to try this in a completely different way. I convinced them that we'd been scaring the animals away and what we needed to use was red lights to go into stealth mode, to be quiet, and to use an optical lure. 
And so um, that is how I came to be involved in this expedition, which was the hunt for the giant squid, which was on, um, in, 2004, in 2012. Um, and um, uh, I had once before been on an expedition that was funded by television. Um, it was, uh, we were the first oceanographic expedition ever allowed into Cuban waters. It was, a, it was a grand time, I had a wonderful time, and I got zero science done because the, you know, it was a Discovery Channel funded thing and, and they were calling all the shots and all they cared about was the shots, they didn't care about the science. Had a great time, but I said I'd never do it again. However, in this particular case, what they were dangling in front of me was <laughs> six weeks at sea at a time when it's really, really hard to get ship time. And I was gonna be able to deploy a new version of this camera system that I developed um, and so I thought, okay, this might actually be worth it. So I was one of the three scientists involved in, in this um, particular expedition. Dr. Kubadera, the guy that got the first still images, um, is there. That's Dr. Steve O'Shea from New Zealand, and I'm the short one. <laughs> um, and so uh, just to make clear, I don't know, how many people saw that, that documentary? A, fair, a number. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, my favorite um, Florida author, Carl Hyacin, describes the first ex time he sold one of his books to Hollywood as being akin to dropping your kids off at the Charles Manson daycare center. <laughs> and putting one's science in the hands of television has very much the same feel to it. Um, a case in point was the name that they chose for this um, production. Giant squid, the monster is real. The, as scientists, we were appalled by this name. We said, well, first of all, of course it's real. I mean, we've been studying dead specimens for years. Um, there's plenty of photographs and material and whatever, so of course it's real. And secondly, we don't think of it as a monster. And, and so Discovery's version of a compromise was to change the title from Giant Squid, the monster is real to Monster squid, the giant is real. Okay, we've got, um, your computer is about to restart. <laughs> it's not my computer. Uh, so, um, oh, well, well, let's not do that yet until we get that fixed. I don't think you want to hide it. You want to make it stop. <laughs> you were about to be logged off. <laughs> I had a computer do this to me once at 3,000 feet in the ocean, and I was really pissed. <laughs> no, it's... It, Oh, is it 14 minutes? Okay, well, just hide it then. Hide it. Hit hide. It'll be 14. It won't hide? Oh. Okay. So, um, just to uh, show you the, um, the setup, this, this is the version of the electronic jellyfish that we had on this expedition. It was in a, in a sphere. And this was the camera system, um, in this case using red light um, that hopefully was invisible to uh, the giant squid or anything else down there for that matter. Um, and then uh, an intensified camera system. And this was just a, a stealthy camera platform. It had no thrusters, no noise makers on it whatsoever. Um, and it was attached to 700 meters of line um, so it just, we just drop it off the back of the ship and then there was a float at the surface with a satellite beacon on it so we could track it and so we dump it in for a couple of days at a stretch and the whole time it was down there it, was, it had the red lights on and the, the blue light that was imitating this jellyfish display um, and we'd you know, leave it down for, for two days and then recover it and then we'd have to go through the video and see if we'd gotten anything. Um, now, just to clarify something, um, this is my really bad artwork, but I got so frustrated with 
newspaper reports, including the New York Times, getting this completely wrong. The New York Times reported that the reason I was successful is because giant squid eat jellyfish. They don't eat jellyfish. Um, so the idea behind a bioluminescent burglar alarm is you've got a jellyfish like a tola swimming along in the dark, and a fish comes to munch on it, and when it does, the jellyfish lights up in its scream for help, thereby making the fish visible to its predators. And so then the squid comes and eats the fish, not the jellyfish. So, got that? That's the burglar alarm. Um, so, uh, as I said, the, this was a recording camera system. We left it down. Because they had cameras running all the time on the ship, um, they actually recorded the first time we actually saw the, the recorded video that we got. So we were just you know, running through the video, um, and uh, there's the electronic jellyfish, and there's the first image ever gotten of oh a live God. giant squid. And over the course of the expedition... We saw it several... We saw different versions, different giant squid, actually. Um, and uh, most of the time it was just toying with us. It would just kind of wave its arms in front of the camera like a fan dancer. Um, and, and we never quite got to see the whole thing. But then finally, I think it was on the fourth or the fifth deployment, we saw this. The full Monty. Scientists going wild. We just went nuts. I mean, it was just fantastic to be able to see this. Uh, and, you know, the incredible thing is, is that it did exactly what I would have predicted if it was a burglar alarm. It went right up over the jellyfish and attacked the enormous thing next to it, the camera platform, which it would have viewed as the, the predator feeding on the prey and, and was utterly fearless in, in going after something that huge. So uh, we were also using this submersible. <sighs> Shut down. Ten minutes, yes, okay, that's fine, we're good. <laughs> um, this submersible is the Triton submersible. Um, it's a three-person sub, and we were going down in that every day for eight-hour dives. And Dr. Kubadera was using um, bait. I had been using the electronic jellyfish. After my success with the electronic jellyfish on the, uh, the camera system, he started attaching this squid jig to the... Um, the bait squid. And so what you're going to see here is you're going to just barely be able to see the squid coming in because this is under red light. So the giant squid comes in and attacks the diamondback bait squid right there. And Dr. Kubadera got so excited he turned on his white flashlight to be able to try to see what was going on better. But by that time the squid was eating on the bait and wasn't going to let go so he risked turning on the white lights and brought this creature of legend out of the darkness into high definition television for the very first time. We actually recorded 23 minutes of this giant squid and it was so completely different than any of us expected it uh, to look, even having studied dead specimens. The color was completely unexpected. Normally deep sea squid are reddish colored, but this was bronze and silver would change color back and forth. And um, that eye, look at that eye. I mean, it looks intelligent it, and it's so enormous. And the, um, right there, you're actually seeing in a, such high definition, you can, you can actually see um, the, the uh, um, olfactory ganglion. I, I mean, it, it's just absolutely amazing. And the, and the changing stripe patterns on the arms absolutely breathtaking to see an animal like this and to think that, that something that enormous, had it had its tentacles intact and fully extended, this would have been as tall as a two-story house. So think about the fact that there's something that enormous living in the depths of our ocean and it's not rare. 
because based on the number of squid beaks, giant squid beaks found in the stomachs of sperm whales, and sperm whales eat giant squid, there's probably millions of these in the ocean, but we've never seen one alive before because of the way we've been exploring. We've actually only explored 5% of our deep oceans, 5%. And we've been doing it wrong. We've been scaring the animals away. So how much more is there down there to discover? And the alarming thing to me as a scientist is I feel like we're destroying the ocean before we're even getting a chance to find out what's in it with, the, with our bottom trawling and the chemicals that we're releasing into the water. And so that's why the work here at the Vancouver Aquarium is so important in terms of conveying to the public the wonders of the deep ocean, what there is down there that people need to be aware of and caring for. And that is actually part of the motivation for the art show um, that we have on display here um, in, in the, um, the Keck, uh, the new um, auditorium that they have downstairs. Um, this is a collaboration between myself and Steve Bernstein. <coughs> Um, Dr. Bernstein and I were graduate students together uh, and uh, we've known each other for many, many years. Uh, I did not know until very recently that he, um, although uh, he's a, um, a techie, uh, that, that he also is an artist. Uh, and so uh, we've collaborated where he's taken a lot of my deep sea photographs and done interesting things with them to make them uh, artistically appealing. And so if you go down into the um, uh, auditorium, you can, you can read about some of these creatures. The, you know, the, there, we have panels that show the original photograph. In some cases, I actually have pictures that show the bioluminescence of the creature. Most of the animals in this exhibit make light, because obviously that's my favorite thing. Um, but mostly it's about just sharing with the world uh, these special, special creatures. This is a deep sea squid um, that's using bioluminescence um, as camouflage for counter illumination. And Steve managed to grab a still frame from that and turn it into this, we love. Uh, and so these are um, for sale. Uh, they are limited editions. Um, and there's a discount to aquarium employees, quite a hefty discount actually. Um, and uh, because the aquarium's offering I think the aquarium's offering 20% and we're offering 20% and then the rest of the money goes entirely to my not-for-profit um, because Steve is so generous uh, to help with our research efforts um, where we're developing technologies to try to track pollution and stop pollution getting into the oceans. Um, so uh, with that, I will close and um, take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Eater. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Eady. Uh, so does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask at this time? Of course, right in the middle. Okay, hold on. <laughs> uh, is there the same, uh, are they both the same, the colossal and the giant? No, the colossal squid is a different species um, and actually one that I'm very interested in. There's, there's some suggestion that the, the giant squid, Architeuthis, may um, be um, bioluminescent, although that's never been confirmed, but the colossal squid is bioluminescent. It lives in um, the Antarctic region in, in the Southern Ocean, um, and it has a bioluminescent light organ associated with its eye. And I have been approached now, given the success of this mission, about potentially leading an expedition down there to look for the colossal squid, and I will do it, but only if somebody else raises the money. <laughs> Hello, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm just wondering how the creatures actually make the bioluminescence, and then you were saying they get exhausted. Could they actually die from giving off too much light? No, they, they don't die from giving up too much light. Um, it's the same thing as, as the way you use up energy to use your muscles. Um, so the, the chemicals that they produce are, go by the name of luciferin and luciferase. Luciferin is the substrate, luciferase is the enzyme. Um, but actually they are completely different chemicals in different animals. The luciferases are utterly different from species to, uh, in different species or different genera. Um, but the, um, uh, the luciferins, they, they share. So there's, uh, for example, in the dinoflagellates, the luciferin is actually derived from chlorophyll. It's a, it's a tetrapyrolic <coughs> compound. 
um, in um, jellyfish and uh, crustacea, it's uh, put together out of three different amino acids. Um, so it's just, the amazing thing is that bioluminescence seems to have evolved at least 40 separate times in evolutionary history. And when you have that degree of convergent evolution, it's a clear indication of the survival value of the trait. Yeah? Um, is it possible that there are squids, like, much bigger than that one? The biggest one ever documented um, it was 45 feet long. Um, but yes, it is possible that they could grow bigger because the ones that we know about are the ones that died and floated to the surface. Um, and, you know, but how much bigger, I mean, there have been, been some pretty extreme claims and, and uh, we just don't know. You're going to have to go down there and find out for us. Um, so you used a screen to get uh, some of these uh, creatures to bioluminesce. So I'm wondering if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about what the value of that is. I mean, if bioluminescence serves all sorts of weird purposes in the food chain and in mating and stuff like that, why would being hit be something that actually makes sense to bioluminesce on? Um, so uh, a lot of the things you ha saw hitting the screen are, are spewing their luminescent chemicals. And so if we were going slower, they'd, they'd spew and then swim away. But because of the speed we're going, they're actually kind of stuck against the screen, although once you Stop, they, most of them can um, move away from the screen. So a lot of what you're seeing is a defense mechanism. Mo most of the, it, it, when, you're, when you're seeing it hit the screen, it's a defense mechanism. Um, and um, uh, the value to us, that's the value to the animals, but the value to us is many-fold. Um, these different chemicals are hugely valuable uh, for um, all kinds of applications, one of the most famous being um, the, one of the proteins that was isolated from a jellyfish that was responsible for the 2008 um, Nobel Prize in Chemistry because it's allowed us to illuminate the inside of cells and, um, and see when DNA is being turned on. Um, and there's, there's uh, all, all kinds of other applications for, for these, um, these chemicals that have, they've been used in cancer research. They're hugely, hugely valuable. What is in the giant squid's diet? That's an excellent question. Actually, interestingly enough, a lot of squid eat other squid. And that's why we were using a diamondback squid as bait. They, they eat squid. They, they will also eat fish. Um, but, but their pre preference for many of these is, is other squid. Uh, what do we think brings them to the surface that sort of started all the legends? Yeah, I think in most cases they, they don't come to the surface unless they're dying um, because they, their eyes have no mechanism to protect from bright light. Um, they, they might come under cover of darkness, uh, but um, in, in general they want to stay away from the bright light because they have no eyelids, they have no irises, they have nothing to protect them. So we believe that most of the time when they come to the surface, they're dying. And, uh, you know, a, uh, a ship coming upon one of these things, I mean, they've talked about, you know, animals looking like the size of islands floating in the water and they come up on them. Well, if the animal's not dead yet but dying, you know, its, it's arms and tentacles may wrap around the ship just kind of instinctively. Um, but from what we've what we've been able to tell, um, I'm losing my, my mic here. Testing? Okay. Um, from, no, that went out too. We lost all, all audio. Um, <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Uh, from, from um, I've completely lost my train of thought. Just totally derailed. <laughs> they, they come up to the surface. Oh, yes. And they're dying. Yes. Um, so, uh, um, that's always an interesting thing to me is, is the, that with giant squid, um, they happen to float when they die because of the ammonia that they have in their bodies. But what about the stuff that doesn't float? How much is there down there that we don't know about? Yeah. Um, has your equipment ever detected sperm whales at death? Uh, has, has our equipment ever detected, detected sperm whales? Um, I know, actually, I don't think I've ever been in that situation. In Monterey Canyon, um, we heard orcas, and in fact, on, on one submersible dive when I was the pilot, um, I had uh, an orca come in and ar around the sub. We talked to each other um, on through water comms called a UQC, and the um, cetaceans can hear it, 
and they sometimes chatter back to us so, so we can hear them. Um, and I, I suspect the same may be true on sperm whales, but there were sperm whales around where we were in um, uh, the Ogasawara Islands, and we were on the UQC and we never heard them. Uh, and the orca that time uh, was, I think I was down around um, 500 feet. Okay, and we're going to take one last question. Uh, this is going to be an online question. Uh, <coughs> the audio seems to be going up. Uh, what, is, what is the brightest bioluminescent animal you've observed? Oh, that's an excellent question. Actually, um, I uh, had caught a, um, a gulper eel. Do you know what a gulper eel is? I mean, it's a, a, it's a very long fish with a huge mouth. And uh, we caught it in some, one of these, these capture devices that we use on the sub that um, brings them up in, in pristine condition. They've hardly been handled. And so we were in the lab on the ship, on, uh, and I had the, the container on the wet lab table, and I reached down in with a big bowl to try to, you know, push the fish into the bowl and then lift it out. And there were people standing all around, and we were under bright fluorescent white lights. And the whole length of this gulper eel lit up, and everybody in the room gasped. And that had to be the brightest bioluminescence I've ever seen, to have seen it that bright under fluorescent lights. Um, it, it, was, it was intense. So I think there's a lot of very bright bioluminescence down there, too, that we don't even know about yet. I think we've got one more question we can take from our online audience. Uh, what research is being done to expand on the wave light spectrum at these depths? Uh, well, um, I, I did a lot of work actually uh, for, for part of my postdoc um, where we were capturing animals and bringing them up into the lab on the ship and then um, measuring the emission spectra, the colors of the light that these animals produce. Um, and that's actually tricky to do because most spectrophotometers are scanning spectrophotometers and given how fast a flash is it's, and how dim a flash is, they don't work very well. So we use something called an optical multi-channel analyzer um, and it's an intensified array where you've got the spectrum spe spread across it. Um, and so we were able to start measuring these emission spectra and that's how we learned, you know, that we, we actually have bioluminescence in some cases that extends down into uh, long wavelength UV um, up and extends into just a little bit across into the infrared um, and very interesting emission spectra. But they're always very broad um, uh, emission spectra and um, uh, the, the, the shape of the spectrum can sometimes tell you something about the chemistry. Don't know if that answers the question, but. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Edith Witter for joining us today and talking to us about the giant squid, the Kraken. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you at our next program, uh, September 23rd on food security. Thank you very much.